Well, happy summer, everyone. You know, for many of us, summer is a time of slowing things down a bit, relaxing our schedules, taking some time off, perhaps doing some traveling. I've noticed a downward tick in the pace here, even in the past couple of weeks. The office is far quieter without the co-op's presence. And having my own kids out of school lends itself to a different rhythm entirely, as I know many of you can relate to. Summer is a unique time. Quick show of hands. How many of us are planning to do a bit of traveling this summer? Oh, Bettina raised her hand really fast. All right, excellent, <laughs> excellent. And others, yep, I see a show. Wonderful. I adore traveling. My parents infused that bug in me early, and it's such an expansive experience when approached with open minds and hearts. So I love traveling, love hearing about travel stories, would love to hear yours as you return from your travels. So let me know, keep me in the loop. And there are a few different approaches to traveling, right? Back when Kevin and I were newlyweds, we found ourselves discovering this truth. For me, travel is about experiencing as much as possible in a new place. When I'm in charge of planning a trip, I'm all about maximizing my time. I have destinations in mind, folks, and usually countless handwritten pages of my scribbles, the product of months of research. Kevin, well, is different. Kevin is actually a doer, too, so in normal day-to-day -day life, we approach this very similarly, but for vacations, not so much. He prefers a slower pace and being more of a meanderer than I do. It took us a few years to realize that we have different priorities and different needs when it comes to taking a trip. And we both had to work to give each other what we each need in that, sometimes together as a couple, and sometimes even taking separate trips without a single regret. But getting what we each need and communicating those things took us a little bit of time. It's interesting that in, this, in the scriptures in general, we see Jesus doing a bit of both. Jesus was never a far-flung traveler. He didn't venture more than a handful of miles away from his childhood home in the entirety of his life. And there are times his journeys seem to be a bit meandery, more Kevin-esque. He takes time to listen to strangers' stories. He welcomes children to have a rest at his feet. He stops at someone's house for a meal. He sleeps wherever he is welcomed in. This is no researched trip. Jesus wasn't checking Yelp to figure out the next awesome restaurant he had to try. He wasn't getting guidebooks out of the library. He wasn't perusing Google Maps to see which route would take him 10 minutes less. He has a very low key pace because it's truly more about journey than destination for Jesus. Kevin would approve. But here in Luke 9, I'm a bit proud to say, Jesus knows where he is going, folks. He is all about the destination in Luke 9. It says he had his face set for Jerusalem. We're going to be spending some time this summer from now into August in the book of Luke. This text marks the beginning of a section that is commonly referred to as Luke's travel narrative. It's the start of 10 or so chapters in which Jesus makes his way to Jerusalem. They can read as sort of a travel journal, if anyone keeps those or has kept those in the past. They're really fun to read in future years, and this set of texts is similar. So we're going to be reading Jesus' travel log. It's Star Trek-y, for those of you who are Star Trek fans. The captain's log, day number 5,291. So one of the things I love about this, and one of the things I think we'll discover in the coming weeks, because spoiler alert, I've read ahead in the log, is <laughs> Jesus' very interesting take on the church when traveling. Of course, Jesus did not establish a church. For him, it was how his followers were to behave in connection and community with others, in community with God. We talk about that a lot here at Woodmont UCC, so this may sound sort of ho-hum at first, Okay, yes, the church is about how we gather and how we communicate with God and be in connection. But this journey, Jesus' journey in these chapters, is far from predictable. 
His words will take us down some pretty surprising paths with unexpected dips in the road and turns off the beaten path. It's a little topsy-turvy, this church that Jesus illustrates, this journey that he's going to take us on. It's the best of all possible journeys in this way. It's surprising and it's fun. So here we have the beginning. Every trip starts somewhere. And there's always a question when starting out on a trip. Who is going with you? Is this trip with a loved one where you've done your work so you're in sync regarding how you'll travel together? Or is this a big time multi-generational family trip? Process is usually a little more slow going with a big group, right? Has anyone ever gotten in line at a tourist site just behind the group of 50? <laughs> That's fun, right? Mm -hmm. Even if it's a solo trip, there's always some form of accompaniment, a good book, an interaction with a journal, a kinship with the car you're driving or the landscape you're exploring. There's always some kind of accompaniment. Jesus had the disciples, and here in Luke 9, he also had some interactions with other would-be disciples along the journey. Three interactions we see. There's that magic number again, that three that we spoke about on Trinity Sunday a few weeks ago just keeps on popping up for learning purposes. And these three exchanges Jesus has, who's coming with me on this journey? They are not the kindest. They are not what we would expect necessarily from Jesus. The first, as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you will go. Well, that sounds pretty good. But Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. The second, Jesus approaches and actually says, follow me, which is a rarity in the scriptures. But when asked if he could return home and bury his father, Jesus replies to this man, let the dead bury their own dead. The third says, I'll follow you, Lord, but let me say goodbye to my family first. Jesus effectively says, nope. <laughs> Full face forward, let's go. Okay, so these are some harsh words from Jesus. It's a little topsy-turvy as we think about this community he's gathering, this church that he is bringing together. And they are so stark when put in contrast to some of the things Jesus says elsewhere. I'm thinking of when Jesus uses one of his last breaths to ensure that his mother is looked after. Son, behold your mother. Woman, behold your son. This isn't someone who didn't care about family or family responsibility, but Jesus is someone who actually believed that something else mattered more. So single focused was Jesus' mission and vision. He had his face set for Jerusalem. He knew the destination. There was no time for messing around here. He had his face and his heart set. Say what we will about Jesus, being loving and kind, welcoming children, being the good shepherd, all of that is completely true. But Jesus was also a bit of a spitfire. And he was very, very sure of himself. The running joke among pastors is that Jesus would have made the worst pastor imaginable. <laughs> because Jesus did not wait for consensus, folks. Nor was he always patient with those who didn't get it. He was a strong soul with a very, very clear mission. And most of the time, even his own followers did not get it. So I'd like to try a little experiment here with us this morning. I'm going to invite you to turn to someone sitting close to you and take just two minutes or so to answer the question, what is the mission of the church? You can talk with a partner or groups of three or four, depending upon where you're clustered and where you're sitting. But once you've batted that around, pick one person in your small group who can share that succinctly. And we're going to listen to each other here. So go ahead, turn to someone sitting close by and answer that question together. What is the mission of the church? All right. Believe it or not, that was two or three minutes. It goes fast, right? Uh, does everyone have a, a single person who's willing to share? <laughs> Well, others 
so many things, they all we, we become, come under the umbrella of sharing God's love. Sharing God's love. It's tough to go wrong with that one. That's a good answer. Does anyone have anything else to add? Yeah, Barbara. <laughs> We sort of boiled it down to making the world better one person at a time. Yeah. Making the world better one person at a time. Yeah. Uh, we thought to, uh, to create community, a place where everyone can be heard, um, a place to bring people together, to follow, to encourage each other, and to um, share the teachings of Jesus and, and work towards uh, being more like Jesus. Yes, thank you. Carol said. Oh, Carol said. <laughs> that seems like a good answer. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody have anything else they want to like throw in there? Yeah. Um, so, and, and talking with Bruce, you know, the first I was saying, taking that, that teaching of loving God and loving our neighbor, and how do we live that out? And and Bruce said, you know, that's all very individual. It's what we do, but we come together as a church, as our community. And, and how do we live that out as a community? How do we, you know, so it's so much bigger than just ourselves. And I think that's really a, a, a big key part of it, is, is what do we do as our community? So. Yeah, yeah, thank you. My mother said to keep faith alive. Yeah. And I say um, to help people be seen and heard. Well, thank you all for engaging with that. Appreciate that. That was kind of interesting, right? It, um, I heard some buzzwords that were were similar. I heard a lot about love. I heard a lot about community. I heard a lot about welcome and coming together and knowing this church that makes a lot of sense. But there was also a lot of nuance and differences in how we interpreted that question. There were a lot of places we could go. And that is also very interesting. We talked last week about how we are, we are one, but we are not the same, right? And I would gently suggest that many churches, not all, but many churches, have sacrificed clarity of purpose for a more general sense of we are friendly. We do a good job here, I think, of speaking about mission and vision, and we have healthy disagreement, and this church is really good at communication, and it can still be difficult to move things forward sometimes when we're in the midst of trying to figure out where we're going. Jesus had his eyes, heart, body set on where he was going. And I think churches can be wanderers. Jesus, here in Luke, is a real destination-focused guy. He knows what he's doing. And what's interesting, in his three responses to these three different individuals, he's not super concerned with bringing everyone on board. When someone says, I'll follow you wherever you go, Jesus' response is actually like, really? Are you sure? Because I don't have a guarantee in the bed tonight. Are you going to follow me there? He tries to deter people who have reservations or commitments elsewhere. To the person who says, let me bury my father first, Jesus' response is really stark. And that one's interesting. Some scholars have speculated that if the father had been currently dying or had actually died, this guy would be at home uh, with his family, not actually out listening to Jesus in the first place. So the theory goes that maybe this guy was actually waiting for dad to die so he could claim his inheritance and then bury him too, which is kind of interesting. But regardless, Jesus is rough with him, and with the third would-be follower too, the message is don't look back, just keep going, always looking forward with a very clear sense of what the mission is. And it truly makes me wonder how, many, how easy or hard this is for us how many churches as a whole do this well? And what our call as WCC might be from here? So folks, I'm not gonna tie this sermon up this week with a bow, because this is but the beginning of the journey with Jesus through these next chapters in Luke. 
But he starts us here with a topsy-turvy idea for churches, especially churches that like consensus. That's not us at all. <laughs> to look forward, says Jesus, with respect, but ultimately with less concern about who is aligned with us or not and more concerned with making progress. That's a hard lesson for a church. And yet anyone who has traveled in a larger group knows that the process is more slow going than it is with just a few who know what's going on. In some ways, serving a smaller church, and you all know this is the first time I've done that in the four churches I've been a pastor for, it allows us to be more nimble to come to conclusions faster and to get moving. Larger groups are harder. As you go on your travels this summer, I wish you every blessing for the trip, whether destination or journey focus. Just be on the same page with your fellow travelers on that one, okay? If your husband wants to rest on a Hawaiian beach, but you have 5 a.m. flights booked to hit up every single Hawaiian island you can legally travel to, maybe find a way to eke out some downtime. I'm not speaking from experience here, clearly. But Jesus, Jesus knew the joys and struggles inherent on life, inherent to a life on the road. And what we've seen of his journey, and the journey for the church this morning, is just the beginning of the log with more entries to come. May we be on the journey too. In the name of God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, 